to get started now. So thank you for uh, joining us today for our sessions. Hopefully everyone had a, had a great time last night. Yes? No? Crowd is tired? Uh, I am tired. I'll give you that much. Um, so you guys have uh, decided to come to the best session of the conference. And I'm telling you that because um, the gentlemen that are coming up here are incredible people. I've had the opportunity of working with these guys, uh, Mark Stewart in particular, for 12 years, over 10, 12 years now. And uh, he's had every single job you can imagine at Trojan One. And he's always been good at all of them, so it actually kind of pisses me off. Um, but, uh, but no, but honestly, if you guys are here last year um, or two years ago, um, we had Mark Stewart speak, and, uh, and it was one of the best sessions that we had. So we've asked him to come back. He's graciously said yes. So without further ado, Mark Stewart and his team. Technologic. 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 Buy it, use it, break it, fix it, trash it, change it, mail, upgrade it, charge it, pawn it, zoom it, press it, snap it, work it, quick, erase it, write it, get it. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. It's good. This is much better than my 40th birthday party. More people. Excellent. Um, so we're going to have fun today. It's uh, funny you go to uh, conferences and they call things workshops. And uh, he's just workshopping my levels here. Um, they're called workshops, but it's usually just somebody up here talking at people. I really want people to participate. We got some stuff that we're gonna hand around. You can see, you can touch, you can try. Uh, this is Garrett Reynolds. Uh, he's one of our creative technologists. Um, his background is robotics, electronics, engineering, computers. He makes uh, crazy things come to life, um, but crazy things that we do for our clients to uh, kind of enhance their event experiences. So Garrett's gonna have a seat down there. I'm gonna call upon him every now and again. So say hi to Garrett, give him a round of applause, because. He's, uh, he's an engineer. They're not the most personable. He also, <laughs> he is, he smiles. He's a handsome fellow. He also, has, he also has one dress shirt, true story. And I have the same one. So I always know if we're going to a meeting, I don't wear that one. So it's all good. So anyways, let's get started. Um, so you see a bunch of stuff that's sitting here. The first thing I'll kind of preface the talk with is, it's not about this stuff. I mean, whenever you're talking about experiential events, it's not about the technology, it's about the story, it's about the experience. This is a way to enhance it, it's a way to attract. Um, so I'm gonna go through a few examples of that. You see this little machine, it's gonna go off every now and again. This is an Internet of Things thermal connected printer. It runs with a little Raspberry Pi, which is a tiny, tiny little computer. And what it's doing, it's searching for the hashtags of CSFX2014, and hashtag X marketing. So the fun thing is, I'm going to rip off what we have here. These are just CSFX tweets from this morning, and I have to go up against Andy, I guess. So let's try to make it, it let's try to get it past my head if we could. That would be awesome. So we'll tear this off. If you want to send a tweet, uh, it'll appear here at the end. I'll rip it off. I'll answer some questions. Um, but let's kind of get started. So dual roles. Uh, Imran mentioned I've been at Trojan One for about 12 years. Uh, about a year or so ago, we started another side venture, um, separate from Trojan One, called Wondermaker. It's creative event technologies. That was born out of a few projects that we did on the digital team um, that really focused on emerging technologies, new trends, uh, social vending, playing with trampolines that sense and play games. Uh, so it's kind of like I have these two brains. One is Spock, logical data analytics. There's a fantastic analytics talk going on there. Hopefully we'll make the video available. Uh, and then there's the Wondermaker me, which is kind of the Doc Brown imagining, uh, doing proof of concept stuff with Garrett and really trying to find new things that we can bring to our clients. Um, but really just trying to have fun at the same time because at events, if your people aren't having fun, uh, then you're not. So there's a little bit about me. So that being said, there's a couple ways that we go about things. The first, whenever we're doing events, is doing the logical approach. This is tried and true. This is stuff that you've done already. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. You all know that Don Mayo talks about, you mean, doing the stuff that people know, the stuff that works. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. We did that for Hot Wheels with the Track Builder Challenge uh, at March break at the Art Gallery of Ontario. The idea behind it was going to a place where the kids are going to be and engaging them with tracks. So there was a building station and a display to get their attention. So that was the tried and true. We knew it would work. Uh, the kids had a great time. It was a nice partnership with the AGO, right target. Um, but then there's another approach, and this is kind of the Wondermaker side of things, and it's really a lot of agencies are doing this, a lot of people, and it's, it's, a, it's a great thing. Uh, Matt DePaola uh, recently uh, moved to a new company, and he's talking about, I don't know if you know who he is, um, he was at Blast Radius. 
he's talking about getting technology in and just trying. I mean, seeing what it does, see what the possibilities are. I like to call that marketing. That's necessarily not working with a brief. We're working without a client saying, here's exactly what we want you to do. We're actively going to our clients and saying, you know what, here's something we think could work. Uh, we've done a little bit of research on the target. They like doing this. Here's activities they like. Uh, so it's marketing. It's really about having a toolbox of things. It's a toolbox of techniques. Um, Garrett, whenever we, we first met about a year and a bit ago, he told me about engineering. Me not being an engineer, um, it's about having a toolbox and really going down a list. If you have one single problem, it's looking at all the possible things that you can do and almost going one by one and wondering, could this help that? Could uh, any of these technologies that we play with, um, social vending, interactive games, robotics, internet of things, uh, microcontrollers, what can we do to make this problem be solved? Um, so you go through, and sometimes it's a combination of things, sometimes it's none of these things. And it's really about taking that approach of making things that don't necessarily exist. Again, tried and true is great. There's great installations that you can get are all ready to go. But sometimes taking that leap, that leap of faith to try something new is a great way. So with Hot Wheels, in terms of building something new, uh, what we wanted to do is surprise and delight not only the kids that we had at the event, but hotwheels.ca gets quite a bit of traffic and we wanted to leverage that traffic to be able to engage with his experience because we thought it was a fantastic build, it was great, the kids had a good time, but there's so many people going to hotwheels.ca that we wanted to surprise them. So what we did is we took some existing Hot Wheels infrastructure and we hacked them apart. Uh, this little uh, elevator, spiral elevator, lifts cars up from the bottom to the top. But what we did on the left-hand side there, you'll see that we have a GoPro camera. So that streamed the track which was going all the time to the hotwheels.ca site, but that wasn't enough for us. So what we said is, you know what, kids should be able to control this. So on the Hot Wheels site, we gave them the ability to launch a car. So they would see the feed, they would go onto a queue, and they would be able to launch a car down the track. Um, it's really about earning, uh, owning your owned media. So that site has a lot of traffic, 25,000, 50,000 people coming through. We wanted to give them an experience and connect them to what we were doing. Making it connected to extending that experience can be very, very simple. Um, the example here was we built this fantastic uh, display. Um, we worked with an engineering company, put it together, and then we saw this light, and Garrett and I were kind of staring at it, and we kind of looked at each other and said, you know what, we have parents here too as well. We run the Hot Wheels social account. You know what, why don't we have them tweet the hashtag for the event and turn the light on? And it was fun kind of talking with the parents. The brand ambassadors had a way to engage with them saying, you know what, if you follow us, you turn this on. It's just a fun little thing. Didn't take a lot of time, didn't take a lot of money, but it added to the event. For Nissan, uh, for the Grey Cup Festival in November, this was a really fun project. And it's a weird disconnection. If you think of football and trampolines, they usually don't go together. You think of tires, running through tires. But this is an idea that the team came up with. Imran was on the team. Um, and we took two mini exercise trampolines and outfitted them with accelerometers. And what that did is we built a custom program, custom game, that would allow people to compete against each other. And much like one of those water cannons at the amusement park, uh, you would bounce on the trampoline and move two Nissan rogues down the field. Seems weird for football, bounce up and down and move a car. But what it was, it was that in with people. It was that sorry, what are you doing? And then you see people jumping on trampolines and things moving. It's that way for a brand ambassador to engage with them, start that conversation. So needless to say, uh, that was a fun project. Exceeded Nissan's expectations, uh, doubled opt-in rate. So it was really because people were going, this is fun. I really had a good time. This is a great example from Coca-Cola. I'm inspired by Coke every day. Uh, they come up with something great, something new. And it's always about building something new and different and taking assets that they have, uh, looking at the target, a problem, and then applying a technology to it. So let's take a quick look at the Happiness Arcade. Uh, and technology also means that sometimes you go to grab your water and you go like this. So you know what, let's start this again and I'll hold this away from my bottle.
Love it. Just this very simple build, and the technology behind doing that, I mean, isn't that complex, but it's the idea, it's the story behind it. Um, I'd like to show this picture because this is what I aspire Garrett's desk to look like, but it doesn't. This is tidy, and there aren't little bits of wire all over the place, but this is a maker. So this is really the inspiration for Wonder Maker. Um, it's about trying and building new things. So he's inadvertently, I believe it's, that's some sort of drone that he's working on there. Um, but there's a whole movement behind this. It's the maker movement, and there's a manifesto. Everybody who's kind of involved in this movement, whether they're working in maker spaces, um, doing things in their own garage, they kind of know the principles of what being a maker is. One of the biggest ones for me is making makes us human. So we make events, we make connections, we make great things. It makes us human because at our core, we're tool makers. We want to get that stick to get into the hole whenever we were 100,000 years ago to get those ants out. That's a step, and it, it, it's, it's inside, of, inside of us. It's part of our DNA. It's what makes us human. And unfortunately, you I mean, a lot of the times that's getting taken away from us. I mean, shop teachers. Shop teachers are no more. Home economics, forget about it. It's not about gender roles at all. It's about allowing people to make things and experiment, try, and fail. Part of that, too, is it's the do it together. Um, whether it's in a maker space, um, it's really about learning from other people. I learned so much from Garrett. I learned a lot from the freelancers that we work with and some of the other partner agencies that have skills that we don't have. We rely on each other to do it. There's no one person that can do everything. So it's really about working together and extend that to all of your partners. You can't do your events. You can't do your sponsorships alone. It's about doing it together. That's what being a maker is. It's about playing, participating, supporting. You know what, if somebody has a problem, we find somebody to help out. Or, you mean, we jump in. I've wielded drills, and I, I had one person in the company walk by me as I'm underneath a vending machine that we're working on with an angle grinder, and he asked, is, is that below your pay scale? And I said, well, helping people isn't below my pay scale. You mean, it's really about jumping in and pitching in? I don't want to be doing that every day, but I'm happy to do it because I get enjoyment out of that. Share your success, give back. That's another big thing about the maker movement. Um, open source technology, we rely on that heavily in everything that we do. That is sharing your success. You're proud of what you did. Here's a great piece of code I wrote, and let that out to the universe and see what people can do with it. And that's giving back, and that's a big part of being a maker. So why do these people, why do these crazy people in their basements, gathering in workshops, uh, Toronto Reference Library, learning about 3D printing, why does it matter to marketers? So the first thing is innovation. I mean, I can, you can see the disruption that a 3D printer has in the manufacturing industry. It's because makers are innovating. Kickstarter, huge platform uh, with great ideas in there that are funded because they fill a need with a very specific audience. So they are innovating, and then they're being <laughs> gobbled up and made massive. MakerBot Industries started out, I mean, from just people who shared things. There's a whole bunch of patent stuff with them that's getting a little bit nutty, but a fantastically innovative company. Partnerships. This is a great way to extend your partnerships with makers. The GE Garage, you can imagine GE and all the innovation they do. You'd think that's closed doors. They're opening this up to people coming in. They're giving their technology to people to see what they'll be able to do with it. In the end, there's always a financial goal. They'll patent that and sell it. That's totally cool, but people are happy to participate in that because people love being a part of something new and interesting. Uh, why makers matter to marketers? These guys, uh, been there, done that. You know what, we've all seen the things, tried and true things still work, but you mean a lot of the targets that we're trying to hit, they are unimpressed with a lot of things. It takes a lot to get their attention and keep their attention. You'll notice that any videos that usually are shared with you, there's an element of I haven't seen that before. You tried something different and new, so that's a big thing, and if, if you're making something, you are making something brand new. Uh, why they matter too is passion. Niche communities, there is a couple out of San Francisco that were big into cooking and they love sous vide, which is slow cooking at low temperature in water in a bag. And they thought, you know what, a lot of the machines that are out there, they're a thousand dollars, they're meant for high-end chefs, you know what, we can come together and we can do this. They got a small group together, probably about 10 people, and worked together on the project, released it, and now they have thousands of these units out there. Low cost because they were passionate about what they did. Imagine they partnered with a, uh, uh, with a food company or with a manufacturer of that, you mean they could do some great things for other products too as well. Um, 
part of that too is uh, it's really about, and just kind of going back to this one, it's about building a better people trap. This is Maker Fair uh, in New York. This is a full scale mouse trap. And you can see the fixation of everybody because they, they're like, how did you do this? And it's, it doesn't look pretty. And that's the thing. Marketers will look at it and go, well, there's, there's bolts here. There's this there. It's, where's my logo? Like, this is what people are coming to see. You can extend that in other ways, but it's really about creating something where people just go, wow. This is a great one. I love this example. Uh, this is, uh, you know what? I'll just let it explain itself. I'd, I'd love to uh, be a part of this. I'm Zachary Solly, and I'm the director of operations at iStrategy Labs, and I built the Red's Apple launcher. The launcher is powered by Arduino sensor, Our Arduino server, Arduino stuff, Arduino, Arduino, and multiple actuators to be controlled on a XY axis. My name is Joe Flasher. I'm one of the developers on the Launcher project. Most all of it's written in JavaScript. The Arduino code is C that we connect to a server with web front end. My name's Taylor Guyden, and I'm a creative technologist here at iStrategy Labs. The user controls the video game on the computer. They point where they want to shoot, and the two arms will move into place and aim the launcher. So, so awesome and fun. So there are a bunch of makers that Ready? came together and built that, and I, I love the, uh, the idea behind it and uh, the execution. So that was fun. So we're going to do a little bit of hands-on stuff. Uh, Garrett's going to give me a hand here. I'm going to hand some stuff out. You might have seen this thing kind of going through and doing its thing. Uh, this is an Ultimaker 2 3D printer. Uh, we got it a while ago. Um, we've made a lot of things that look like toys. So the lightsaber especially, whenever that was printing out, uh, Mark Harrison thought I was insane, but hey, I have a lightsaber now, so it's pretty awesome. Um, these were all printed on this machine. Um, really, a lot of the things that we do, too, are not about just building things that are useless. Um, we, uh, we do a lot of things, uh, uh, social vending machines, uh, so we need cases for our Raspberry Pis, and rather than going out, which is the little computer, rather than going out and spending 25, 30 bucks on a custom case, we just print them off, and we get that from open source 3D files that people supply because they had the same problem that we had, which is how do we contain this? And we print it off literally for 50 cents, 25 cents. So we save money. I tell Mark in 10 years, it's like a solar panel. It'll pay for itself. So one of the things that we did, and I don't know if you did see, we talked to a couple people, and they didn't really notice this too, too much. But I encourage you to go into the guidebook. Um, inside there is a little guitar pick. Um, Garrett, do you have that guitar pick there? But I can explain. You know what a guitar pick looks like. The thread that's printing off here, the material is a plastic that has graphite in it. So that little pick is conductive. So it's like a stylus. So as you hold it, it actually conducts the electricity through the pick. Normal plastic won't do that. Two, if you go to wondermaker.com slash play, you can play an HTML5 guitar. So take that pick, go to the site, and play with it. It's really about combining that technology with the ad to get a message across. Hopefully that kind of explains the, it's not about the tech, it's about the message. But we had fun printing that, Garrett especially printing off 350 of those things. So that's what's printing right now. So if you want it after to come up and take a peek, I can explain more on that. Um, but essentially what 3D printing is, 
Um, it's just printing layer by layer. Some of the objects that you're holding, it feels like they're solid, but inside of that is a honeycomb. So it's not completely solid plastic, so you don't use a ton of plastic to do things. It's very, very efficient. So really what we're trying to do with this is uh, uh, create things uh, that haven't been done before. I'll go through some drawbacks of 3D printing. Um, with events, we're kind of going through a bunch of pros and cons. We're working with some people right now to, uh, to, to deploy some stuff. But take a look at this one. This is a good way to incorporate this into uh, an activation. Morning Wind Trophy Bot. We took tweets about morning winds and turned them into something amazing. A tweet like this one. Passed a mirror this morning, did a double take. On myself. Morning wind. We got a guy and scanned him. The bodysuit was unnecessary. We just thought it was funny. Then we used some technology. Some of our smart friends. This 3D printer. Magic. A guy with a spray can. And an etcher. Thinger. Then we put it all together. Jimmy just throws the confetti. And we mailed it out. Boom. Your very own trophy. More confetti, Jimmy. Morning wind. Morning wind. Morning wind. Morning wind. Good morning wind. My head's an umbrella. Lots of you tweeted, and we ran out of fake gold. But we didn't run out of internet. So we also made digital trophies. Oh, look. A sweet tableau of crunchy Belvita breakfast biscuits. Steady energy. All morning long. Belvita Morning Wind Trophy Bot. What's your morning wind? So very fun, and they overcame a lot of the, uh, uh, the issues um, that we see with 3D printing at events. Um, number one, it takes a while to print this stuff. You'll see that this is going. There are, Gary, how many are there? There's eight that we're printing here. That took, it was 20 minutes to print those? A little less, a little more? 40? See, a little while. So it's not as fast as you think, but there are ways to get around that. So one of the things actually that we've been playing with is taking custom cases that are already done and doing little inserts. These print a lot faster, so if you did those at events, it would be a lot quicker. Um, but the way that Belvita did it is taking time to send it out to people. Uh, there will be tinkering. These machines, not necessarily temperamental, they're better than they were years ago, but there will be tinkering whenever you're doing this. Uh, nozzles will clog, so you need to be able to know that that will happen. Um, this is a conversation starter. I can't count the number of people whenever I was carrying this down, uh, from the guy who grabbed my bags out of the car, down the elevator, uh, this morning as I was walking in with it, people are going, what is that? And I start a conversation with them. Uh, the camera guy at the back talked for five minutes. At the end of it, I had some sort of promotional message for him. I would have had him, would have nailed him on it. Um, but it's really, it gets, it gets that conversation going. Um, think beyond plastics, too. It's, if you, if, it's, it's, a, it's a stupid little joke, but it's, it's as easy as X, Y, Z. So it's really because, think more than plastics. Uh, food substances you can print with sugar. Uh, there's a pancake 3D printer. Uh, so go beyond that. Anything that is liquid that can be extruded, um, you can do with 3D printing. Um, there's an example that I definitely want to show you uh, just after I go through some other idea starters that uh, really shows uh, 3D printing at its max. So some idea starters. Uh, use 3D printing to build anticipation. Let people know whenever they come to your event or whenever you're going to engage with them that they have the ability to either engage beforehand, send a suggestion, enter a contest, and when they get there, you'll have something for them. That could be one way to approach it. Um, create a destination. Make it somewhere where people want to go. This does attract people. It's funny, I was in event tech in November, and even like people like me were still gathering around these things because there's different models, different kinds, faster prints, different colors, multicolors. So it creates that uh, destination for people to go to. Um, make it personal. You'll see Velveeta. You mean it's all about connecting with that person through Twitter and surprising them with something, with something that they did. That's always a great way to do it. Uh, make it collectible. These are collectible because you can't print 500 of these out for all 500 people that you're going to have at your event. So make it uh, a collectible. IBM did it last year at Wimbledon. For every round winner, they printed out a little mini trophy, and then when they won the round, their name went on it and it printed out, and then they would give those out to people. You'd visit the IBM tent, and then you'd be able to have the chance to get one of those limited edition trophies. Um, and give a reason to return. Again, if you're asking somebody to, uh, maybe if you're printing something out for somebody and you want them to come back, it's a great way to get them back. If there's a reason to either send them somewhere else, engage with them after the event, it's a great way to get people to return. Uh, this was at South by Southwest. Uh, how many people have seen the Oreo trending vending machine? No? Okay, take a look at this. This is, this was amazing.
Hi, I'm Doug McMillan from the Wall Street Journal. I'm here in Austin, Texas for the South by Southwest Interactive Conference. Thousands of young tech savvy influencers descend every year and increasingly marketers and big brands pull stunts to try to attract this audience and engage this audience. This year, one of the stunts that people are talking about most is a 3D printed Oreo machine. We're gonna have a look at this really interesting one of a kind machine here. Let's make an Oreo. And the first step is going to be to select the type of Oreo that we're going to make. These correspond to hashtags that are trending on Twitter this morning. Each hashtag corresponds to a different Oreo design, different colors and a different design. Let's go here with hashtag SXSW, South by Southwest. The, the machine is gearing up to produce the Oreo. They created this machine by hacking a traditional uh, 3D printing machine. Instead of using two Not heads, which true, a traditional 3D printer uses, this has 16. Four of those are for different kinds of wafers, and 12 of them are for different colors and flavors of the actual cream filling. So as you can so see, just in the interest of time, I'm going nice to go through. Um, pattern here, nice on here, design. there's a transparent LCD. That was almost one of the things that, that, that I love so much more, because as this was printing, you couldn't see what was happening. But whenever you select it, it would open up this little window, and you get to see inside. And it was funny to watch people. As soon as this little transparent LCD opened up, people would just be going like this, trying to get their heads as close as possible to see what's going on. So that was a great success. I'm going to fly through these. I'll try to do it in five minutes or less. In fact, I, I have to. Uh, so these are some trends that uh, we've identified. Biometrics. Um, at South by Southwest, um, Subway had a great installation that used uh, brainwave monitors. Uh, it was for their new flat tees. It was about uh, uh, innovations. So you had people concentrate on this, uh, this new product that they had. It wasn't necessarily, you could think about anything, how much you love your dog, how much you want to get out of this session. As long as you were thinking really hard about that, you would win. There'd be a meter, and the first person to reach that with consistent brain waves would win a prize. And, and people just loved it, lined up, uh, thought it was magical. Um, facial recognition in a mirror. This is a mirror that whenever you stand in front of it and you smile, it automatically takes your picture at the event and tweets it out, and then you go get the picture. But it only activates whenever you smile. Uh, Sochi 2014, I'm sure a lot of you probably saw this one. Uh, this was the Russian subway system. You would get a free pass if you did some squats in front of the machine. Uh, that was really, really cool. Uh, fingerprint scanning, too. How many people have the iPhone with the fingerprint scan? Yeah, a few. There we go. Disney, uh, if you've ever been to Disney, you've got fingerprint scanning to get access. Again. It's not necessarily you're going to see this at a lot of events, but it's as these products start to become more and more commonplace, the ability for us to bake those into activations is going to become better because people are more receptive to the technology. Uh, wearables, another great trend, Oculus Rift. Um, that is a fantastic immersive technology. Again, you can't churn hundreds of people through this, um, but it really, in terms of virtual reality, this is not 1990. This is fully immersive beautifully shot, it can be animated, it can be real live video. Oculus Rift is a great way to uh, uh, expand your event. Uh, the Mayo gesture armband, uh, so this measures the electrical signals in your hand, so you can use that to mani man manipulate things. So imagine a uh, first person shooter game, you could be going like that and shooting gun, you could be a claw game going like this and manually doing that. So again, it's about doing something a little bit different. Um, this one is the uh, uh, Nivea. So this was a trackable wristband that they put in an ad and you would put it on your kid, sync it to an app, and this was for while you're at the beach to make sure that your child stayed in sight. I don't necessarily think that's an amazing thing. I think you should actually be able to look at your kid and make sure they're okay. I don't know if it had a water sensor that if it went under four feet, it would go off. I don't know. But again, interesting use of technology. A lot of promotion for Nivea on that one. Event staff. Who would love to track their event staff? That would be awesome. Where did they go? How long were they there? Combine that with other technologies. How many people did they interact with? Uh, and I'll explain that with some mobile location analytics in a second. Uh, advanced display technology, there's a lot of great technologies out there. The transparent LCD is really fun. You can do a lot of stuff with that in terms of revealing and unrevealing things. It's really just um, an element of the LCD that gets taken off. It's, you basically strip something off and it's still a normal LCD. Um, but what you can do with that creatively is great. Uh, interactive projection foils, if you have an event, uh, this allows people to touch a projection on a surface, usually a clear surface, and engage with the content. Uh, the uh, 4K revolution, obviously you mean the crispness of images is amazing. 
Uh, and then we have the, uh, the IR bezel. So this is basically turning everything into a touch surface. It's a little frame that goes around any display and it works like a touch screen. It just senses your finger and the position of it and relates that to the content on the screen. What am I doing for five minutes? I'm doing good. Socially reactive installations uh, during Pride. Uh, raise the Pride. One of the uh, copywriters that we recently hired at Trojan One actually was one of the people who did this project, and we only found out whenever we saw him in the paper. Uh, lovely. So you would uh, send a hashtag of um, uh, raise the pride, and they had a flag that was connected to Twitter that would go up and down based on the sentiment of those tweets. It wasn't just about the hashtag, it was about how, what people were saying around it, positive, negative. Uh, social vending, Twitter Canada, we recently did a t-shirt machine for them to see people in that space amazed by a machine that you'd tweet and a shirt would drop down, blew my mind. It's still one of those things, it's, it's a little bit of magic. Uh, another thing you can do, uh, this was at South by Southwest, a Twitter balloon, uh, make your activation pop, so you'd send a tweet and the person that actually made the balloon pop would win a great prize, it would inflate with every single tweet, it would count the tweets, that was really fun. Uh, this one, uh, German Granada snack, uh, you would get a ball out of a machine. Um, what it would do is they would shoot the ball, the dog would have to go get it, come back, and based on how long the dog took, it would dispense treats for the appropriate size. So it was all about healthy weight management. But again, a very custom bill. This thing doesn't exist, but it gets a message across about weight management for dogs and being active. Technology and content, you're gonna see this a lot. Uh, again, as I mentioned in the videos that you usually see, it's about that new thing that you haven't seen yet. Uh, sign of the times, this is a sign that, that changes based on the user input. So from information from the user, it'll, if it knows that you like opera, it'll show you where the opera house is. So it's really connected. Uh, Coca-Cola, this is analog technology. It's not all about digital. This is a cap that you would need somebody else to open. Um, Domino's Pizza, this was a pizza delivery system where the box would be stable, so no more slidey cheeses. So that was, that was really cool. And then Duracell in Montreal had a bus shelter uh, that had a heater on top, but the only way to activate the heater was for one person to touch here, another person on the other side to touch, and then to hold hands and feel the warmth, so to speak. Um, lovely, lovely activation. Gets a message across. Um, I don't have tons of time to show this one, um, but the idea behind this one, I'll, I'll play it for a second. It's, it's a concept video, and it's actually something Garrett and I have been talking about. But whenever I found this, I love that they put this together. So. For, we've developed a fleet of on-demand drones that you can task 24-7 to complete an assignment of your choosing. We realize that you don't need to own a drone to take advantage of this exciting technology. In fact, you don't even need to know how this stuff works. All you need is your device and a problem to solve. Let's say you're out trekking around San Francisco. You can task a drone to come and take HD photos and videos of your adventures. You use voice commands to convey the task, so come take pictures of me. And then when the drone arrives, you hold up your phone with the flashlight on so the drone can lock on to you. And now you have a set of high quality photos that beat the hell out of you know, a bunch of awkward selfies. If you're headed. So, very, very cool. It's called Gopher. Go check it out. It's a concept video. A couple guys from San Francisco put it together. But imagine at your event, if you were allowed people to get a photo. So, a blues fest, you standing in the crowd with the killers behind you with a drone. I mean, that, that's amazing. It's so much better than that. Um, but uh, yeah, the technology behind it is, is pretty complex. So a quick hands-on here, Garrett's gonna give me uh, a help with this. So this is beacons and proximity marketing. So if you've been to an Apple store lately, beacons are small little Bluetooth low energy devices um, that can last, they last about a year or so, but what they do is they're able to connect to your phone uh, through an app and communicate back and forth, whether that is a message that you mean you're in the right place, the wrong place, here's an offer. The Apple Store does this, so you can actually walk into the Apple Store, purchase your product on your device through the app, and walk out of the store without interacting with humans. Isn't that so much better, isn't it? Yeah, okay, I know, I like, I like interacting with people, but it is applicable to a lot of events. Um, so Garrett's gonna show quickly here, I'm not gonna show this example, because I think actually doing the demo is gonna be a lot more valuable. Um, but this was some, look for CES, Consumer Electronics Show Scavenger Hunt, um, and you'll see this. But this was done uh, 2014 in January. New at the inter um, This was a scavenger hunt. So that's actually, rather than explain, I'm gonna get Garrett to get his tablet connected to my device here. And I need a volunteer, and I have some shirts here from Twitter Canada. Um, if somebody will volunteer um, to show how this technology works, anybody? Hand? Yes? Come on up, come on up, awesome. See, there you go, workshop. 
the last time somebody came up. Usually there's people sitting there writing notes. That's okay. Okay. I am connected. I should have done, I said to Garrett before the presentation, I should have said, um, well, that's because we're mirroring. Okay, give me one second here. This is gonna throw absolutely everything off. Apologies for this. When we had to set up, I didn't have the presenter show here. All right, Garrett, hold it up. <laughs> we'll do that. All right, so what we've done is we've placed beacons around the room. Your job is to try to find all four beacons. You're gonna go with Garrett, he's gonna show the app. So essentially what's on here, so if you press get started, or let's go. It is. So maybe if you can hold that app to show everybody what you're trying to do. She's trying to collect four badges. So during, while I'm going through and explaining this, you'll be able to hear this too. If she collects all those, you'll be able to get a shirt, um, and let's see what you can do. Garrett, if you can guide her around as we do it, maybe just say, count out the ones and twos and threes as we find them, and he'll, uh, he'll do that. And I can show you after, too, how this works. So, essentially what it is, you've got these little devices, connects with the tablet, um, and sends a signal. So as you get closer or farther away, it tells you how far you are away from the device. You can do it with numbers, you can do it with a directional error, you can do it with any way, but it's really to try to direct people to a certain area. She's getting very, very close there, so that's good. So imagine this in retail. So if you go into one location, you've got the retailer's app or an event app, it lets you know what, you know what, you're in this location, I have a special offer for you. Um, Beacon triggered offers hold strong potential for influence, so whenever people have these great offers, they are more likely to purchase or participate. Um, some idea starters for this. Um, Integrate with your existing app. It's, it's literally a couple of lines of code, so all the work is done on the back end. So if you have an app done by a developer, um, you don't have to go and spend tens of thousands of dollars to get this done. It's really taking a simple piece of code and then putting it into an existing app. You don't have to really rebuild an entire app. The other thing to do, uh, welcome to the event. So as you get somewhere, welcome people. So if they have your event app, like the CSFX one, uh, we just actually built this about two weeks ago, so we didn't have time to put it into that app, unfortunately. Um, it helps guide people around places too. So if you're at Blues Fest, imagine if you had this and it could have you directed you to the gold circle instead of me going the entire other way around, getting a drink because I was lost, I had to, and then finding your way back. It'll help you get to where you want to go. Um, enhance the experience too. Um, in terms of what you're doing, use beacons around that to enhance. And she's going to get up, don't worry, we didn't put it under anybody's chair or anything, so it's not going to get too personal. Uh, this is really a way to add value. So Major League Baseball is doing this, so whenever you're in stadium, uh, depending on your preferences, you'll get offers. Um, you'll get a little bit of information on stats. If you go near the collectible store, it'll let you know, you know what, you've come three times today already, or three times this month, you're eligible for something. Um, another t-shirt too, I'm gonna talk about mobile analytics technology very quickly. Anybody know what this movie is? Just yell it out if you know it. No? Ah, there you go, t-shirt. So Brazil, so we're gonna be talking about mobile location analytics. If you haven't seen Brazil, Terry Gilley movie, great, it's about surveillance state. But don't worry, mobile location analytics is not that. So 60% um, of people um, have a smartphone. So this is very recent data, it's about 60% of all Canadians. 96% uh, of those people have their Wi-Fi turned on all the time. So they're active Wi-Fi mobile users. 45% of that, uh, Android operating system, 34% of people are on Apple iOS. So in terms of Wi-Fi, mobile location analytics is about being able to know how many devices are in a defined space. Your phone is constantly broadcasting a Wi-Fi MAC address, a network address. Got it, there you go, round of applause, thank you. <laughs> Nicely done, I'll grab you your shirt after, thank you. Really appreciate it, I'll get you two. <laughs> Um, so what you need is you need people's Wi-Fi turned on. So the great thing is, on iOS, uh, total numbers here, I don't know why I can see that, uh, we have 82% of iOS Wi-Fi is always turned on. So of all the iOS devices, 82% of people have Wi-Fi on all the time. Android, you actually have to go pretty deep into the settings to, to be able to change it. 94% of people have the Wi-Fi turned on. Why does that matter? Hey, it's a black box, isn't that exciting? What's inside the box is what's really, really cool. 
So what it does, it connects with the devices that are in the given area. It lets you know how long they're there, um, how close they are, so whether it's 25 feet away, 75 feet away, you can define, what we usually do is we define 25 feet as an engagement and about 75 feet out as an impression. That's somebody who might walk past your booth, walk past your activation. 25 feet is usually with a brand ambassador in the area. You can change those variables too. But what it looks like in the end is this. So you'll get a report, and rather than somebody being able to go, you know what, we get 5,000 people coming to the, uh, uh, the country car show every year. Like, well, do you have ticket sales? How do you verify that? Head counts. This is real data. And then from those earlier numbers, you can infer. You're not going to get everybody. But what you're going to get is a solid set of numbers that allow you to say, definitely these many people were here, unless it's just phones that are lying on the ground. Usually people have to carry them around. You're not going to know personal information. That's why the Brazil thing doesn't apply. I don't, you don't know anything about these people. What you can know, though, which is really interesting, is whether they come back, whether they go somewhere else. So imagine you're doing a sponsorship, and a restaurant is sponsoring an event, and they go, you know what, we've sponsored this. I wonder how many people who went to Blues Fest came into our restaurant. So throw a beacon at the entrance, throw a beacon at your restaurant, and you go, you know what, devices that came here came to my restaurant, and these are the total numbers. Again, infer some other numbers from that, it's going to be a pretty solid set of numbers that you can go to sponsors and partners and be 100% sure on. Ticket sales, things like that you can still track to confirm numbers are fantastic. If you don't have a better way to do it, this is a, this is a fantastic way. Uh, we did this little field test. This was the Trojan One office. I'll just go back to this very quickly. Uh, so in the Trojan One office last week, I threw one of our sensors down. Uh, average time around my office was 24 minutes, so I don't know if I'm that scary. Uh, 3,897 impressions, so that's total time, so it's not uniques, and then 880 engagements within the local area. Uh, technology lets you know what the busiest day, the busiest hour is, the operating system that people are on. Um, we did a field test last night with the killers too. I actually got this little gray box into there. Uh, people thought it was a cash box, everyone was asking me. But we placed it in the area, um, and sorry, here on the tablet, uh, you know what, you'll have to come up and show, show you, we're having some connection issues. We had a, a real-time dashboard that shows that. Um, and I can show you if, you if you talk to me after. But we did a test last night. I think it was like 4,000 or so people. Dwell time obviously was a while. Um, but really interesting technology. Um, what this can do is event space optimization. You'll know where people are in your space, whether you have too many people going to one location, not another. Uh, you can measure influence. Again, the idea of did they go here, did they do that. Uh, you get real data. And combine that, too, with existing data. So you have those receipts, ticket sales, attendance numbers. Combine the data together, and it's really another data point for you to either prove a case or uh, do something else. We're almost there. It's 11.45, and I'll get you out of here in one minute. Don't worry. Just grab your lunch to me. I want to see pictures, people. OK, how does all of this apply to you? I encourage you to work with your partners, challenge them, ask questions. Don't always go for the standard thing. It works. I'm not trying to tell you not to. But once in a while, get outside your comfort zone and try something different. Um, it can be a quick test, um, but yet yeah, challenge people to do different things. And there's a lot of great agencies and partners out there that are doing some fantastic work. And we hope that as people see more of this stuff, they're more apt to do it. Um, again, don't be afraid to try. There's a reason that I've never seen that before works. It's because somebody tried to do it. You know what I mean? Like when you haven't seen something and someone does, you're like, I didn't see that. Someone finally did it. I didn't even know I liked that. Uh, set metrics for everything. This is not just building things for the sake of building things. This is building things for a reason. Even whenever we do proof of concept stuff, we have a goal in mind. Whether that is, you know what, we need to be able to print this in 20 minutes, so we need to find an efficient way to do that. We need people to be able to get through this experience in 30 seconds. Whatever those numbers are, you need to set that data. Um, at the end of the day, I encourage you, outside of your work, outside of this, outside of business, outside of nine to five, build stuff, make stuff. Keeps your brain healthy, keeps your hands active. Um, just build and make, it's what humans are meant to do, and I encourage you to do that. Um, one last thing, the first thing, um, check this out online. Um, I'll show you the 15 seconds if I can. So then what they did is they had the QR codes. You're going? What's the first way to truly explore a city? World's first. So world's we need to first, say world's, world's first. first. No. Weird. OK, anyways, ask me about it. I'll show you. Um, final parting words. This was a glass that my son got me for my 40th birthday. He got it from Urban Outfitters because he saw the word shit on it. 
and this is 100% true. When he gave me this, it was the best gift I ever got, and I'm not kidding you, because it reminds me every single day that's what you need to do. At the end of the day, do epic shit and make things. Uh, thank you. All right, unfortunately, guys, we do have to get you out of this room, so um, I'm sure Stewie's gonna be around. I say Stewie, Mark Stewart. Oh, look at that. Big round of applause for that. Thank you, everybody, for all those comments the, uh, and tweets. It's the other room, probably, too. All <laughs> good, but thank you. Um, if you come up and chat, I do have a couple more shirts to give away. If you'd like a Twitter shirt, I can give you one, no problem. I think I got six, two are accounted for, another one's accounted for. No t-shirt, can Pop by, say hello, and it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. All right, thanks again, Stewie, everybody. Round of applause. Um, we have an over for lunch shortly, so um, Stuart, Stewie, sorry, Mark Stewart, Stewie is what I call him. Um, we'll be around all day uh, today and tomorrow, so if you have any questions, feel free to grab him and you know, try and get a beer with him too, because he's a very, very passionate guy, as you guys can probably tell. Thanks again. Thanks, Wayne. Can I have the microphone? <laughs>